I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Dude, you're jacked though. Like, how old are you right now in this moment? 66. Six. You're 66? Mm. You're nearly 70? I want to see a topless, like, men's health cover from you. <laughs> like, don't understand why this hasn't happened. M. Rosciano is not someone you can easily define. When I'm on stage singing, telling jokes, it's like what I was born to do. From Australian Idol and Breakfast Radio to stand-up comedy, she's now embracing exactly who she is as one of the nation's most loved entertainers. Courage is the thing that I think I have. Being courageous just means you just believe slightly more that you can. Then you disbelieve. Correct. She's been in the public eye for a long time. Mate, try being me in the fucking commercial television and radio environment. Men who want me to be quirky and neurodivergent on air, right, and all those things that entail, they love that. But then off air, I'm still going to be that fucking person, but it's inconvenient to them and hard work. I neglected a lot of stuff and I was rude to people because it was basically you're either in or in my way. And then grief, unimaginable sadness. You, you felt it? Yeah. My whole life I've just wanted to be seen and you saw me even though I hadn't said anything. M. Rosciano, welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you for having me, Boris. <laughs> oh, well, I love that. This very, that was very... Um well managed by you in the way you say thank you for having me like that was that was practiced <laughs> extraordinary uh, what do you want me to say it says here born lives in victoria i guess you were born at some stage yes um, i was she, she 43 lives, years ago she lives in victoria thank you for for defining that mm-hmm. um describe yourself as an italian bogan what the fuck is an italian bogan well because i'm first generation oh my god can you hear <laughs> I'm going to take the Italian out of my voice. My dad was born in Italy. My mum's Australian and so I've got – and she's a country girl. So I got the combination of the country Victoria and the Italian and that produces an Italian bogan. And also often first generations, we're the worst. You know, we really embrace both cultures and mix them together. You're including me in this category because I am I part feel like of, you I am are, first, yeah. I am first generation. I too. feel like you hide your bogan pretty well but it's there. No, it's deep down it's there all the time. I used to have it in my hair. I used to wear it in my hair. Like, I know. Oh, it was beautiful. Um, I don't know why they get such a bad rap. Why does a bogan get such a bad rap? Well, they don't for me. I mean, I love a bogan. Yeah. I'm drawn to them. A lot of my friends could be classified as bogans, but I guess it depends what your definition of bogan is. Yeah, so it's, it's not a bad thing. I, I think no. in my mind bogan's good. Me too. Yeah, like it's good Aussie sort of tucker. If um, someone says someone's a bogan, I know that we're going to get along. Yeah. Straight talking. Um, don't have to worry about the small talk. Often don't have to say g'day, how are you, just straight into the middle of a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Italians, when you think about it, are the same. Italians say what they think, they get emotional, they get in. So I think it's a lovely combination and I think there's a lot of similarities. And does emotional play a part in your like, your, your daily life, yeah. emotion? Yeah, yeah. Like how? Can you tell? What do you mean? Well, I, I don't I'm know. I'm led by I... them. All my nerve endings are on the outside of my body. Well, I don't know if I'm feeling something, but like. What uh, are you feeling? People no, always I'm feeling say energy. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. People always say that if I, there's a lot of crystal shops near where I live because I live in that area of the world. And whenever I walk into those shops. Was that Danny Nong or something like that? Where in Warrandyte. Warrandyte, okay. Yeah, down on the Yarra in the, in the winery region. And the women who work there always say, oh, you've got an energy. And I don't know if it's chaotic or good or whatever. But I don't know. I just, everything bubbles on the surface and everything bumps into it, good and bad. And it's just it's how the only way I know how to be. Otherwise, I feel like I'm going to explode. Have you always been this person? Yes. Like as a little girl, for example, when yes. you were like little. Yes. But I mean, I started getting shushed from the age of two, probably. Shushed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spent my life being told M- to be quiet. Sh- mm. yeah. yeah. Always. So the secret life of M started developing really early on in my head, where I would escape to and make up fantasies and stories and. Um, but also this is a safe space for me. Like I can already tell you and I will get along and you accept me for who I am already. So if I didn't feel that way, I'd probably just shut down. So like. So that, that's your, that's your response. I swing. Yeah. Yeah. Extremes. So because as I look into your eyes, um, which by the way, I will describe them. They're a, a hazel color. <laughs> they're actually a very pretty color. Thanks babes. Okay. And, and as, but as I look at your eyes, I feel as though. I've, there's a feeling I can't see you there. But as long as my, your eyes, I, I can sort of see um, synapsing. Like I, I feel as though I can see, you know, between the, the neurons in your brain, fucking fast movement yes. and lots of activity. Always. And it feels like to me that you're not speaking at the speed at which your brain's going. No. 
If but I you want at the to. Speed, yeah, if I speak at the speed which my brain goes, I talk like this and I'll be able to tell you about how my days are every day. They're really hard but they're also really good and I go to bed at night and then I do like a stock take of everything I've said all throughout the day and I think how many emails do I have to send to apologise for things I've said or what do I need to write down so I can remember and this is the pace my brain goes at. But I'd say even faster but go. I've learned to not do that because it's very overwhelming for people. Yeah, and that's how I felt when you first said hello to me when you greeted me, okay? <laughs> I felt as though this is learned behaviour. Yes. And... Someone said to you, well, mum, dad, uh, therapist, someone said to you, Em, slow down. Slow down. Pause. Mm-hmm. Between, Breathe. Yeah, and, <laughs> which is, by the way, is a skill. Mm-hmm. A skill as a presenter, which is what you are. Mm-hmm. It's a skill. Um, it doesn't, not all of us are naturally like that. Um, take a pause and think about what you're going to say mm. as opposed to just pouring it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah, I'm not very good at that. I'm better now, but I get most of the times I've gotten myself in trouble in my life is because I don't think before I speak. It just comes. What about if you're drinking on the booze? Um, How's that go? It tends to quieten me down a bit. Why, really? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I think I function as a normal human when I've had a couple of drinks. It yeah. probably mellows me a bit. That's cool. So, so as a result of, the way your brain works, mm. which you've now become more aware of, would you describe yourself as a participant or as an observer? I do both, if that makes sense. So my part of my brain is always taking information all the time. Like I can tell you what colour the shoes are of one of your producers who's got green cons on and I can tell you like there was a girl who before and she had a night jacket on, which is great, and I will always remember the cap she was wearing she looks great. And so that stuff my brain's always taking in. Um but I'm also, yeah, just making sure I'm not saying something weird or like I told one of your guys that I forgot to take my ADHD medication and could I have some water and I don't know if that's a normal thing to say out loud. So I think my brain halves. Um, I often am overstimulated and understimulated at the same time. So I'm I'm hypersensitive to light and sound. I have to wear like headphones around everywhere. Otherwise everything goes in and I get really exhausted. So I think part of my brain's chemistry is to be both an observer and a watcher. Because a lot of people, if they're too heavy on the observation piece, um, they tend to not capture their audience because they don't participate enough. Mm. But there's plenty of people who participate too much Mm -hmm. and they tend not to observe what's going on around them. Mm. And I was listening to a really interesting thing this morning and then I listen to the BBC and there's a sign show on and it's about it was about um That's very on brand for you. I'm glad you're doing that because that fulfills everything I would have thought about you. Oh really? That you start the day with the BBC. Yeah. I do not, which won't shock it's you. It's SBS either. three, but it, SBS three just just, just pushes it. BBC Good. news out. Good. Yeah, on, on digital radio. And what did you take in this yeah, morning? Yeah, so we were talking they were talking about uh, and I felt like it was in the conversation actually, but they were talking about uh um, our ability to multitask and is there such a thing as multitasking, which is why I asked that question about observing and participating at the same time. And uh, there's and they were talking about our limited capacity. If we are concentrating on something quite deeply, mm. like for example the way I'm speaking to you, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking about you and I'm talking to you, my ability to observe or be conscious of other things, in other words, conscious of uh, all those things around me. So, so effectively one of our producers, say Jono, could walk in here with a gorilla suit on and I might not even see it, mm-hmm. even though I do see it, because my brain, the back of my brain, which is receiving those things from my optical nerves, which is my sensor, sensory system, um, blocks out everything else and just hones in on you. Mm. I can do that. Mm-hmm. I can be completely absorbed in my conversation and not know what the fuck's going on. Someone mm-hmm. could become with a fucking knife about to stab me in the back. I wouldn't know, right? Mm. Which is, you know, I live in the corporate I would, world, I would so that tell happens you. all the time. Well, there's a state with people with migraines uh, called hyperfixation. And hyperfixation happens when your brain locks onto something and falls in love with it. And you never know when it's going to happen. And you Is never know. Is that called a rotomania? Maybe. <laughs> what the fuck? I don't think so. No, I'm just joking. I know. But no, yeah. So um, my hobby is starting hobbies. And I get something will just capture my imagination. I don't know, pottery or drag race or it, it could be any topic. And I have to know everything about it. I become obsessed with it. It's like I've literally fallen in love with it. And I know the minute it starts happening, I get, I get, it's like when you see a a person that you're attracted to and your whole body is kind of starts like the, the gravitational pull, you cannot resist it. When I get in those phases, like the world could explode around me and I would, I forget to eat, I forget to sleep. 
Um, and that is a trait of someone who's neurodivergent is hyperfixation periods where you have to learn all about it. You have to like be the expert and you'll do three years worth of work on it in one month. And then all of a sudden you just fall out of love with it and it's gone and you move on to the next thing. There is such a thing called a romance, you know, of course, you're right from the, from the Greek sort of language, like being in love, but a man, it's a manic. Yeah. yeah it, but I don't mean manic in a destructive sense. No, I know what you mean. But it's, it's manic in other words, you are, as you said, fixated. Yeah. Hyper fixated mm-hmm. on something and you're not actually in love with it, but uh, you're But it's the same obsession. Yeah, you're absolutely. You're enthralled by it in a manic way. And I never know what it's going to be or where it's going to come from or why it captures my heart. Um, but it does. And often that's how I've written some of my stand-up shows is an idea comes to me and it's, I, I feel breathless and I have to sit down and I have to get all the electricity out of my fingers and just quickly write down, just spew out all the ideas I've had around it. And then I'll spend eight months kind of rendering it and creating it. But the initial burst of idea just comes to me and I can feel it. And I've got to like, I've got to sit down no matter what I'm doing or where I am, I'll pull over or do a quick voice memo. And then I'll be able to hyper fixate on that and craft a show out of it. And I've been lucky that I've been able to kind of, in a way, control that to create my career. Um, but, yeah, I, I I do get into those phases, as do a lot of people with ADHD, where it, it can be detrimental to the people around you. I was, I was going to ask you, advantage or disadvantage? It's both. I mean, ultimately an advantage if you learn how to control it. And also I'm now good at telling people I'm hyper fixating on this. Can you come and check on me in two hours and make sure that I've, like, gone to the toilet and, you know, that I've eaten or, like, I'm really good at telling my support people now that, I'm going in. I'm going into a creation coma. Please check on me. Um, I'm I'm better now because I know why. I didn't really know what it was until I was diagnosed with ADHD and then learnt it can be actually a superpower if you learn how to play inside of it. Yeah. But I think years ago it was probably a bad thing because, you know, I neglected a lot of stuff and I was rude to people because it was basically you're either in or in my way. That's how I approached it. Because I've got something to do. Yeah. And I was like on a, you know, like a mission from God. Like yeah, this yeah. is the thing yeah, I'm yeah. making and if you're not as fast and if you're not as clever and if you're not in with this as much as I am, if you're not on my level, then like you're irrelevant and I would just have the blinders on. And, you know, that's terrible if you're in a team, Boris. Like, yeah, you yeah, know, totally. It's not good. You, it's funny. You just reminded me. I often go on these, you know, speaking tours and talk about things and one of the things I always talk about is being prolific in your expression of what it is you're doing could be if you're on Instagram, you're talking about your brand. It could be, you know, how many times you perform. You might be able to do 10 a week, whatever, you know, three podcasts a week, whatever the case may be, but be prolific in what you do in order to be successful is what I'm saying. Mm. And where I got that idea from was um, I entered into a business partnership with a guy and I won't usually tell it, say his name, but um, this particular business was a, a fund manager. And, but when I first entered into this business with him, I agreed to fund him because the guy definitely had ADHD but in an extreme version. Mm -hmm. Hyperactive. But really brilliant. Yeah, right. Really brilliant guy on his subject matter. Yeah. Nothing else, just his subject matter. (laughs) But really brilliant. Mm. So I agreed to fund him and uh, that business grew to multi-billions of dollars in management funds and all that sort of stuff. And one time his wife told me that um, she was getting concerned about him because she used to have to go there at 2 o'clock in the morning in our Mm. office and bring him home mm. because he'd be sitting there typing up stories for the AFR, finish review. Um, he'd be he wouldn't move away from the screens. He'd be mm. taking a leak in in a Coca Cola bottle Jeez. that he took the top off because he didn't want to miss out on a basis point here and there in the financial markets. And uh, but when she used to go and get him, she'd have to give medication. But his eyes were starting to glaze over, and it was quite an unhealthy mm. state. But his ability to be so prolific and produce shit. Yep. Was the reason why our business became so su- successful, which is what I actually put the money into in the first place. Because I feel bad, I sort of used him, but mm. I knew that he would take it to where I needed to go, and mm. I didn't have to do a fucking thing. Mm. Just invest, mm. and 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 I had to do some support, but that's about it. And he became he was diagnosed as a, a severe ADHD, like really mm. heavy duty. Can that be a problem for you too? Um, like where you get to the state where you got to you're glazing yeah. over. I'm combination type. I'm inattentive as well, which is the dreamer vibe, which is often what women are. Like more often than not, you're describing someone who's pure hyperactive ADHD, where it's just constantly searching for the dopamine hits, just always looking, always scanning. Um, and so for me, I'm both. So I think I'm enough of the inattentive type that often I'll be working and then I'll think about something else and then I'll be taken out and away to that. 
So I can't, I think, I think if I didn't have three kids and a husband, um, I think I would very much probably get the eyes glazed over. I think there's potential in me for that, but there's other things around me that are more, more important that I can pull out. But I definitely think my eyes, I, I do have that potential. What is the process, so to speak? You go along to see a, 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 a GP or who, who tells you about this? Yeah, I, I went to see my GP first because I was just really struggling because the pandemic for me as someone who is prolific, everything stopped, Mark. Like yeah. this bit, I wore busy as a badge of honour. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so busy. I've got all these things going on. And then I realised I'd built this kind of house of cards of coping techniques to give my ADHD brain stuff to do, you know, I'm making this, I'm making that. So I was always stimulated. Busy, busy, busy. Mm. Then that all fell away and I was struggling to do really basic things like, you know, just think about what we're going to have for dinner and answer emails and just function as a normal human that isn't busy all the time. And I'm like, I'm doing a quarter of the stuff I was doing before this. Why can't I get out of bed? What the fuck is wrong with me? So I went to my GP and he's like, well, maybe your iron levels are bad, maybe you're starting early menopause. And he'd seen some articles about the rise in ADHD diagnosis. Like he'd seen some medical journals. And this guy also delivered me. He pulled me from my mother. He's known me my whole life. And he's like 72. And he said, you know, you could fit the profile of ADHD because he's known me my whole life. And he said, so he made, wrote, wrote me a referral. I went to see a neural psychologist and I had to do a, a three sessions with them. And they ask you questions about your report cards as a kid, what people say about you, you know, your your personality type. Then they hooked me up to a test where they put electrodes on my skull and they made me sit still for five minutes and monitored my brain activity. They monitor your your brain waves, particularly your delta waves. Yes. And um, my brain was interesting. Um, Do they give you a show to watch? No, they didn't give me. I just got the report. Like I didn't. And then I had to also sit in front of a test where I had to press a button every time a white ball appeared. And so after about 30 seconds, I started anticipating the white ball. Then I got distracted because the lady doing the test looked like Alanis Morissette. So I started thinking about Alanis (laughs) Morissette, forgot to press the button. Um, And they came back and I did so well on that test. Like I was so ADHD. I was minus seven and I think the normal was like zero. Like zero is normal. Minus 10 is the worst. I was minus seven. So I got the diagnosis and um, this was during the pandemic. It was like a Zoom diagnosis. You're saying cool. It was like, I was just like, because honestly, before this, like everyone, I just thought, oh, ADHD is the troublesome kid in class. Yeah, yeah. He's a boy and has red cordial and he's a shit and everyone wants him to go away, right? And then I'm like, oh, right, okay. So then I Googled it and started realising that this is chronically underdiagnosed in women because there is a symptom recognition bias because of those little boys. Um, little girls get missed because they don't cause trouble in class. They're quite the opposite. They're they're quiet. They're not saying anything. They're disengaged. So teachers aren't going to pick up on it because they're not giving them any hassle, right? So the first study on women wasn't done until 1997. The first study involving women with ADHD wasn't published until 2001. So there is very little going on for us, very little studies. We've just changed the guidelines now in in Australia in how we're diagnosing and looking for symptoms, especially in young women. So there's a whole generation of women my age who are getting diagnosed now, oftentimes because their kids are being diagnosed and they're seeing themselves in the diagnostic process and going, oh, shit, okay, yep, that was me at school, that was me at school. And, um, yeah, for, for me it was a huge light bulb and initially I felt, oh, okay, I'm not a bad person, I'm not a broken person, I'm not a crazy person. There's a reason. I have a reason. I exist and there is a reason. And then grief, just unimaginable sadness. You, you felt it? Yeah. I mean, I still now, like I'm still sad about it. Um, but why? Because from as long as I can remember, I felt like an alien absurdity. You mean lost years, years just wandering around. Ten-year-old M, yeah. yeah. And like before you're 10, kids with ADHD um, get 20,000 more negative messages than neurotypical kids about themselves. You give them to yourself or no, other, others give them to you. teachers, try harder. Why are you being lazy? You're disorganised. That's not good enough. Be quiet. Uh, you're wrong. Aberrant. Correct. 20,000 more before you're 10. That's a lot. And that starts to shape your self-esteem and the core beliefs about yourself. Yeah, or well, your neurological story. Correct. Yeah. Because I'm different. We're trying to exist in a system that's set up for neurotypicals and set up by 
you know, straight white blokes how many hundreds of years ago. Mm. That system is going to, we're going to fail. And and I did. And so you go back and think of all the times where it was, in fact, your brain wiring and not you as a human that you have spent 40 years building shame around that particular personality quirk you have. So it was a lot of grief, which, you know, I started therapy pretty much straight away and I still do it. Every what does therapy look like? Therapies. Is it cognitive stuff, is it? Yeah, it's retraining the way you think about yourself. It's it's. Oh, but it's not trying to teach you to think more like the. No, definitely. It's not conversion the, therapy. The, the, yeah, there's, it's not trying <laughs> no, to get no, you to become No, no, it's typical. more like, oh, if I didn't complete something or I reacted in a certain way, it's okay. It's because of this, not mm. because you're deficient. So it's just understanding your process. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and reframing. And just, how to get the best out of your process. Yeah, reframing a lot of situations in my life that I thought, you know, I, I really just fucked it and I never under, really understood why. Friendships, relationships, jobs. Um, so it's just a big, huge, raw process that I chose to really just immerse myself in and I hyperfixated on my brain, which is, you know, I, I wanted to really understand it all and learn about it because, you know, my three kids are neurodivergent. My son was diagnosed as autistic six months ago. I'm getting assessed for autism in two weeks because, well, I am. Um, but all this world has now opened up for me and for my kids and that, that's the whole reason I did I did a press club address a few weeks ago, a national press club address on this topic and the reason I did that was because I know that the world is set up for neurotypicals and my kids are all neurodivergent and I want them to fucking flourish and I want them to work outside the system so I have to make that happen. I mean I, I often talk about ways of thinking and I try to, uh, there's convergence and divergent thinking. I mean, convergent thinking to me is just mathematical, one plus one equals two, um, and we always end up at one point. Um, divergent thinking I think we need to employ, but everyone needs to employ, both convergent and divergent, because divergent thing is like I give you a box of um, paper clips and I say to you, if you're a, a convergent thing, I say make something for me. So they'll join them all up and they have a straight line. I'll say to a, a divergent person, a divergent thinking style person. Here's a bo- the same. I would boxes. make jewelry. They'll, they'll make something different. Yeah, they'll make something. I'd make art or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So divergent thinkers are very good at creating stuff. I personally don't see the difference between calling someone a neuroconvergent or mm. a neurotypical or a neurodivergent. Um, I think we need to th- try and think both. And if yeah. we're at one end of the spectrum, mm. we're divergent. Mm. We need to try and train ourselves to do a bit of convergency just to make ourselves more accomplished mm. but if we're fucking at the other end we're so typical we're so mm. convergent mate you've got no fucking idea what's going on you've got to learn how to become a bit of divergence so for me i think we all should be looking at everything and trying to be both yeah and a little bit more of each or but first off recognizing because i think there should be a diagnosis for neurotypical <laughs> Can just walk around and what do that. What the fuck? You know why not? You no, know, we don't need to. Yeah, but I know. But you, but you should know that you are one. If you are one, yeah. And dude, start to learn You've how got to become some limitations. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, and learn how to just... move down the move down the spectrum a little bit. Just get down the other end a little bit if you can. It's just, mate. Try being me in the fucking commercial television and radio environment. Like, it is run by neurotypical men, especially when I was around, who want me to be quirky and neurodivergent on air, right, and all those things that entail. They love that. Be, do, do the things. But then off air, I'm still going to be that fucking person, but it's inconvenient to them and hard work. Yeah, because they're there managing a process. Mm. They're trying to standardise everything yeah. so, that you, so that they Hamburger can. Hamburger with a lot. Correct. So. And I'm not that. Yeah, but they need you in the show. I remember yeah. there was a woman on television, like you wouldn't remember, many years ago called Jeannie Little. Of course, Jeannie Little. Jeannie Little's my icon. She was the first drag queen. You know queen. what I'm talking about, right? I used to sit down in front of her. What I dress f- like her because of, like, Jeannie I Little for her. me. Oh, my God. She was I my favourite person I loved on telly. Her. Yeah, but I, I Rest in peace, Jeannie Little. She died yeah, two totally. years ago. Did she only die yeah. two? Uh, I, knew, I knew she passed away, so I was just trying to think She's when. She's why but, I say, oh, darling. Yeah, darling, that's it. Oh, oh darling. Yeah, that's I love it. that you love Jeannie. Yeah, yeah, I love Jeannie. And I used to think to myself, those people try and manage it. Correct. It must have been a fucking nightmare for them because they don't understand how she thinks. Mm. But so, we don't need to be managed. I know, I know. I'm just That's saying. That's the issue. But they don't know how she thinks. Yeah. You don't need to be managed. They're correct. No. Nah. But, but that's the problem. So mm. I, I want to ask you, just, I might just move back a little bit on this. Um, you can go wherever you want. I'll follow. Okay, cool. So your children. Yeah. You three children, did you say? Yeah. Boys or girls? Two girls, one boy. Okay. So... All of them um, have some form somewhere on the spectrum. Yes. Okay. 
and basically the spectrum doesn't mean fuck all, but it just means, um, you know, there's a sort of a line they draw like that. Mm-hmm. And the higher, the closer you get to that line on the graph, um, the, the, the more divergent you are. Mm-hmm. To be honest with you, I like to be at the top of the graph. <laughs> I don't never really want to be at the bottom of any fucking graph, but if I can help I don't it, but, fucking think that's going to be a problem. But, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So, but how far along the graph or how mm. far along are you, the, the spectrum are your children? So Elio is level two. Is my son. Yep. yep. He's three and a half. So how far along? Like, I he's know we're right level up. two. He's, he's, okay. he's autism spectrum yeah. level right. two. But high functioning? High, um, yeah, we don't we don't say high functioning anymore. I know I say that. Okay. No, only because compared to what? You know, know, like that's that's the thing. It's like it's a bit ableist. So he he's extremely verbal. He's extremely empathetic. His challenges are more around he would have been called Asperger's back in the day. Mm. Um, he likes things to be a certain way. He's very rigid on things. He's super sensitive to a lot of stuff. He only eats three types of foods, pasta, eggs and bananas. That's it. Um, so that's where he's age, at. Age, sorry. He's three and a half. Right. And he's glorious. He's just the most beautiful kid. Um so he will require an, an aid in class with him. He's very, like, freakishly bright but doesn't really like kids. <laughs> it just sees them as an annoyance. But he likes adults. Loves adults. But he'll announce when he's with kids, I don't like kids. And he'll tell people he's, like, 48. When people ask him how old he is, Elio says, I'm 48. He's incredible. <laughs> he's a complete weirdo and I love him. Then Odette is 15, my middle daughter. She is complete inattentive ADHD. She's high up on the spectrum also. Um, she's an extremely incredible artist but has no interest in anything else and it is a battle to even get her to go to school. Um, she's switching out to an art high school for VCE next year, which is HSC. I don't yep. know what you guys call it. Yeah, yeah, HSC. Um, and I just want her to love learning. She doesn't sit in that plans. I don't give a shit about standardised tests. Yeah. She, I just want her to roll up to school and take what she can take and pass. And that's been my attitude since she started schooling. My eldest is Marcella, who's nearly 21. Marcella's a girl, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And she um, got a 97 for her ATAR. She's a genius. She's ADHD combo type like me. Um, and she's pretty hyper spectrum also. Everyone presents differently, but we're all extremely like up on that graph. And um, my eldest is a typical eldest daughter, and I had her when I was her age, so we're we're best mates. But she's really highly organised, very driven, um, the complete opposite to her sister, yet has the same, pretty much the same diagnosis. Um, but Odie's more inattentive. So how do they get on? Um, well, they're six years apart, yeah. so pretty well. The, the top, uh, the two yeah, of us, yeah. Twenty-one and yeah, and fifteen. They get along well. They're very different, but they, also, same, same, same um, father. Yeah, same dad. All yeah. the way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the three and it's a half. It's pretty year unusual old. today, but that's why. Extremely I unusual. So, uh, same, same dad. Same um, dad. Um, so, yeah. but everything's. What's his deal? Like it, Scott is a high performance coach. Yeah. Um, he started in AFL, and now he works with people like you to help him figure out shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, Scott is undiagnosed uh, but definitely a magic brain like all of us. We're all complete units. We live in a house that's really unusual in that everything's very open. We yell at each other all the time. We're very close. We always end up in the same room. Um, I don't know, everything's, when people are around us, everything's very open and we're pretty blunt blunt and brutal with each other. Um, Everyone's an asshole but everyone's loving. Like I don't know, when I go into other people's houses I realise that my family's quite unique in the way that we function. Um, I have a really transparent relationship with my kids, always have. There's nothing's off the table. Everything is discussed, everything. Um, so it it works in a way that but we're all kind of our own islands, if that makes sense. We're all lone wolves that move in a pack together but really keep to ourselves and no one gets offended or upset. I don't know. We, we're always You're near not too other. sensitive then? Um, no, we're all hypersensitive. No, I mean to if someone says, if someone yells at you, Oh, yeah, nah. You know, what are you yelling for? It's no, I'm Italian. Guy. Like, that's fine. Like, yeah. I grew up being yelled at and then Dad and I'd be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Fucking hell. And then I'll walk away and two minutes later he'll be like, do you want some pasta? I'm like, okay. yes. So yelling for me is fine. It's if someone's being mean or deliberately misunderstanding me that triggers me because I've always felt misunderstood. Um, but I don't know. There's a, a level of trust in my house that, you know, Scott's up against it, my husband. There's three of us girls who are brutal. Um, so if he walks out in an outfit that is not great, which is often the case because he's a surfer and a cyclist and he doesn't give 
He wouldn't wear shoes if he didn't have to. Um, he, ta- he takes it really well. Like we'll send him back in sometimes. What, what do you say? Go he'll on, be like, go like, like he'll come out and he'll be like, mate, no, I'm not walking next to you in that. What are you doing? It's too small. Change it. And he'll be like, okay, fine. It must have shrunk in the wash. And then we like, go, oh, yeah, it shrunk in the wash. That's the problem. And then the other one will be like, it's the ice cream you're eating every night. Then Elio will just join in something. But, yeah, it's pretty, like, it's, I, I like it. I don't know. It's, it works for us. So how does this, uh, whatever you want to call it, I don't know if I can get Just say it. Whatever the condition is, whatever the fuck what? it is, whatever the word is. ADHD. How, how does ADHD affect your career? Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> I've always been a risk taker, right? So I was an elite athlete. I qualified for the World Juniors, 100-meter uh, hurdles. What, hurdles, yeah. Yeah, so I met my husband. I was a, at the Victorian Institute of Sport and he was one of the high-performance coaches there. Uh, he's six years older than me. Um, so I've always been goal-orientated. I've always been – I love co- being coached. I love being challenged, which I now know is my brain searching for dopamine, right? I've always been attracted to hard shit, ridiculous hard stuff that most people would be like, nah. So when I fell pregnant at 21 – I'd been with my then boyfriend for four months. He was working at Carlton Football Club. I was training for the Olympics and I got pregnant. I'm Italian Catholic, unmarried. Most people were like, Em, you need to get a termination. Like this is ridiculous. You're a child, you're training, blah, blah, blah. And my brain was like, no, I'm doing this. Because it was like it was a hard thing. It was a big, ridiculous mountain to climb. And I just decided, no, I'm having this child. And thank God I did. She's incredible. And nearly 21 now. So we moved to Adelaide. The Australian Idol auditions rolled in and I was at karaoke with some of the wives and they heard me sing and they saw the ad at the bar after a game one night and said, you should audition. And I was like, no, nah, I don't sing. I'm not a singer. So the next week I'm like, oh, fuck it. I'll just go on. So I went and well, auditioned. You weren't pregnant. You, uh, yes. I'd had a two-year-old. My right. cello was two. Right. So I just rolled into the auditions, never sung in public, no business being there and sung and made the top 12. And came ninth, right? The first time I sung in public, pretty much bar a couple of things at high school, was in front of a couple million people on national television. I'd never had a band. I didn't know how to arrange songs, nothing. But I just like baptism of fire, let's go. Did you do a cover or you write your own song? Covers, have to do covers on Idol. Okay, right. Right, get voted off Idol. Then I do some radio interviews. A few radio bosses hear me, their ears perk up. Oh, she's articulate. She's pretty funny. Um... We need her on radio. So I get offered a job in breakfast radio. Had I ever walked into a radio studio? No. Did I know the first thing about fucking delivering a radio break? No. But did it bother you? Nah. Nah. I'm drawn to that. I get excited by that. So I said yes. So we moved to Perth. We moved to Perth where I stayed for five years hosting breakfast radio for Today FM. And then during that time I got offered some telly work. Never done it before, sure, and I did the project. And then... One of the guys there said to me, Charlie Pickering, who used to host it, you should do stand-up. And I was 34 at the time, I stand-up. And I'm like, okay. So I wrote a stand-up show and I performed it to like 10 people. And then the stand-up started really picking up. And then I was tweeting and Mamma Mia, Mia Friedman's site, saw my tweets and said, you should start writing for us. And I'm like, oh, I can't spell and I don't know where semicolons go and I'm not really great, you know, with that stuff. And they're like, no, but we love the way you write. We'll have editors. So I started writing and then, you know, everything that I've ever done has been because of the way my brain's wired, because I'm drawn to hard things because I have, uh, people with ADHD are deficient in dopamine. We don't have it. We have really naturally low levels, so we seek it. So with, often you'll see with young guys who have ADHD, they're risk takers, they drive fast, they go skydiving, they're looking for ways to like bounce off things and feel alive. My brain's the same, but for me it's like challenging job opportunities I'm drawn to. They excite me. Um, So my career has built that way because I'm not scared. And I always believe I can just like 1% more than I think I can't. That's just the way my, I just was like, what what if it works? And I want to stop you on something really important. You said you're not scared. I want to just clarify something in relation to the way you think. Yeah. Um, There's a difference between saying I'm not scared and I'm, and someone might say, she's just fucking fearless. It's not fearless. You're just not scared. No, I'm full of fear. Yeah, but I was going to say. I'm anxious, man. M- m- most people would say, oh, she went and did fucking radio. She went and did Idol. She went and did radio. Yeah. Well, 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 most people would be saying, no, I can't do that. I th- well, it's courage, I think. 
there's this false idea of confidence, right? Confidence is a fucking sham. It doesn't exist. It's bullshit. I don't believe in confidence. I know plenty of mediocre people who are confident and shouldn't be. Courage is the thing that I think I have. And that is, and all you need to, to being, being courageous just means you just believe slightly more that you can. Than you disbelieve. Correct. And it can be fucking 1%. It's not a big I'm walking in with a puffy chest going, I will dominate this and I can do this. That's not what this is. It's much smaller. It's like it's so much smaller and it's just a tiny little thing in me that's like, yeah, but what if it works? Give it a crack. So that's that's what has been the driving force in me and that is that tiny bit more, just the courage and it is all you need is like if something comes to you in your life and you're like, I really want to do this but I don't know if I can, you just need to get across the line just a little bit. You know, some people think it about it so hard that they don't actually Analysis do it. Analysis paralysis. Yeah, they yeah. don't do it. My husband is that person, which I think is why he was attracted to me because I'm the opposite. Because you do it. Oh, yeah. I just like go in and think um, my attitude has always been, which I think has a lot to do with my dad, I'll figure it out along the way. Like, yeah. I'll, we'll, we'll be fine. Yeah. I just assume it'll be okay. But some people might say, well, she's reckless because. Yes. Yeah. I am. Definitely. But in some respects. That's part of why you do things and you you try things and you sort of employ the spray technique and you sort of say, well, something's going to stick. Mm. I'll try all these things. No, I don't agree with that. I don't do something unless I'm pretty sure I'm going to fucking nail it. I've abandoned plenty of things where I'm early and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to be out of, I'm not going to be good at this. So you walk quickly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that will fail fast. Yeah, yeah. The risk assessment happens very quickly. And if it comes back in my brain that this isn't going to be your best work. I back out pretty quickly. So you never do any weird shit like did uh, were you a, a daredevil like No, I'm too anxious. I think because <laughs> I was raised by an Italian man who's assuming everyone's trying to kidnap us at all times. I think that got <laughs> put into me very early. And you know, wog parents are yeah, like, yeah. you know, be careful where are you? Don't well, you, you know maybe for girls, my old man didn't give a shit. Yeah, right. Go. Yeah, no, for me it was so I think that was very much instilled in me. It's weird. My fearlessness it picks and chooses. I, 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 I did write off three cars before I was 21 for, and I'm often on probation for losing all my points. Um, but you probably wouldn't even know how many points you got at any one time. Nah. Yeah. Nah. But I like I'm, I'm always running late. Like, no, I wasn't. I was reckless with certain things but I wasn't the person like, nah, doing dares and shit like that. So you're not. Uh, so because didn't I, have any friends either, Mark. Like I was pretty low. Yeah, but you didn't care about it. Mm. Did that bother you? I think at the time it it did. You're but talking I, about at school. At school, yeah. yeah. I think I think at the time it did because I was pretty lonely. But even when I got around people that decided they could be my friend, I still felt like we were operating on different channels. I would sit there listening to them talk, like nodding and smiling. And that's when I started performing, when I started learning I could just pretend to be a different person and people might like me, and that's called masking. Mm. So I would get around certain people and slip into a role. Where does performance or well, performance in a social environment, mm. where does that fit for someone with ADHD? So, mm. and, and do, does everyone have to do it do, do, to some extent? To, yeah. To just to just even, the, even things up to make sure you can have a social environment. Some, I mean, a lot of us can't at all, but I think being a woman especially, you learn pretty early on what's expected of you socially and often I would break those rules. But you do observe as a way to survive, oh, okay, well, I just need to like not speak then. And I need to laugh even though I don't think it's funny and I need to smile even though I don't want to. And those are things that just neurodivergent, neurotypical as a woman, you just learn to kind of disarm the environment in certain ways. Um, But I think for people like say your mate, the guy that you had the business with, he wouldn't be able to regulate himself. No, he he can't. He's always And he's also inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Always. And I have issues with saying stuff I shouldn't. Mm. and so I'm often blunt and direct. I forget to say, hi, how are you? Like sometimes I just start a conversation with, hey, I was thinking about that thing the other day and then the neurotypical person will often look at me and go, how are you? Hello. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, fuck, sorry. No, no, how are we today? Yeah, please, oh, how are we? What yeah, the fuck? Yeah. And I'm just like. I don't know, how are you feeling? I'm like, just please don't slow me down because I'm going to forget what I'm going to say. And like, you know, if, my management know that, Nick and George and the people that work around me now, they just know like, okay, she's going to come in at 10. But Nick, our manager, you know, he's like him and I work. You can imagine it was either going to be a massive disaster or hugely successful. Nick and I can just come in in the middle of a conversation and just fucking go. Um, and he doesn't get offended or upset. Or And so I've surrounded myself with people that 
just know that I'm just going to come in and go. How long did it take you to work that shit out? 40 years. Yeah. My whole life. Yeah, yeah. Like truly. Did someone actually open the door for you to meet Nick or yes. did you chase Nick out? No. Yeah, Ben, right. Yeah. we Nick and I were never meant to... I was just in a in a. It was so strange. I was in Sydney, and Nick's brother Ben, who does drive here, um, he just contacted me out of the blue and said, "Which is very, this is very Ben. I think you're really interesting. I want to meet you." And I'm like, "What? Who? What? Because I'm from Melbourne. I didn't really know much about Ben Fordham." And I'm like, "Okay, cool." So again, my brain's like, most people would have been like, "No, you're a strange man, and I don't know you." So I'm like, "Okay, cool. Tomorrow." So Ben comes to the hotel and picks me up in his car. He takes me to this really beautiful place with lots of flowers and shit, takes me out for breakfast, buys me flowers. We just talk at a million miles an hour. I've never met this person. And then I end up telling him I'm in a bit of a bind with something I'm making. He's like, my brother can help you. And I'm like, oh, okay, who's your brother? And he's like, Nick Fordham. And I'm like, okay, great, cool. So then I get this phone call from Nick. He's like, my brother said he met you. Let's meet up, see if I can help you. So Nick helped me in this situation, didn't take any commission, didn't charge me, and he was really cool and I'm like, okay, I like him. So he flew down to Melbourne a month later and we chatted and that was it. When you look back on your life and you're only young but you look back on your life and think, how the fuck did I meet these people and uh, why did they come into my world? Yes. I don't know. I think I think you I attract. I don't know if it's luck. Maybe. Maybe I also think I attract a certain type of person. I also think if someone decides they want to step into my energy, they're already a certain type of person because <laughs> I don't really hide who I am. Like you know what you're getting on the menu when you order me. So someone already knows that and then they've chosen to step into that world. I already know that they've got it in them to, to be great with me and we could do something. Um, I, I rarely chase things down because I'm so used to being rejected. It's not often I reach out and ask people for things. I'm so used to doing stuff by myself. So, um, but I have had every situation in my life and when you look back with hindsight and you join the dots, it's wild. The turns that my life has taken and the people that have come in and out of it and the situations that I've ha- been in and opportunities I've had, like you, you couldn't make it up. You could not make it up. Does someone like you need a manager? someone in your life that, in your business life at least, that has a different process to you, more calm? Yeah, I mean. Someone like Nick. Nick's very calm. Nick? Relative. Yeah, Are we talking about the same Nick? Yeah, well, I think he's calm. you think calm. Nick's calm? For relative to me, for example, he's involved in my business here. Yeah. So, I mean, I met Nick through his dad. His dad was my manager yeah. talent as a talent thing, so-called talent. Um, and then when his dad passed away, Nick took over. Mm. And uh, I find Nick calming. To you? Rel- to me, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's relative to me, he's calm. Maybe I bring out the chaos in Nick. Yeah, or maybe I'm more chaotic. I would say you're calm. If I had to look at you two together, you would be the calm one. Yeah, but that's because I'm older and I'm, I've am i learned how to be, be that person. I would say Nick and I are like chaos in a bottle together and then we have Georgia, his right-hand woman, who has to wrangle the chaos. So I definitely need Georgia. Nick is great because Nick goes into things for me. It's always good to have a straight white alpha male on your side in this industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, And Nick is that for me. Like Nick just goes in and fucking seals things and like puts the hard word on, you know, like he's my, well, not a protector, but I'm I'm glad to have Nick with me. Closer, I need Nick for yeah. that stuff. He's a definitely. closer. Yeah. yeah. But Nick doesn't go out and chase down opportunities for me or whatever. Like that's that's not what he does. Yeah. Georgia does that and yeah. Georgia does all the details and shit. But Nick comes in when he has to. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's so funny that so interesting that you think that he's calm. Yeah, yeah. Around me is at least. Um, I find that because – She's my world. dying. Can you look at her over there? George is in the room with us right now. I know, like I said, but my but my world's a bit my world's a bit chaotic, relatively speaking. Yeah. For my in, in, in yeah. My, my business world is at least. But I mean, do I need a manager? Yes. Yeah. So when I walked because when I walked into the studio and I saw you sitting there in the reception area. Yeah. On the lounge. Um, you know, obviously knew who you were. And then there was another person in the room uh, who I had to say hello to, and uh and that other person was speaking quite a bit, like addressing me about blah, blah, blah. You heard the conversation. But I could feel. I was so, yeah, I'm glad. I I could feel it on my right side. (laughs) I could feel this fucking barrel of energy just wanting to jump up for the fucking land and start speaking. I was a cage. I felt so awkward, but I didn't want to say anything weird. Because she was really striking. 
I don't know who it was. Yeah, but I don't mean so much from a looks point of view. No, 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 not looks, energy. Like yeah, yeah, she no, was no. great and I was sitting there like. I know I could feel this other energy on my right me. side. That was I me. I could feel it and I thought she's going to fucking jump up any second I nearly here. did, but I didn't. That's me oh, no, masking. No, but, that's no, me learning. That's mask. That's what you call mask. That's yeah. a technical term, is it masking? Yeah. Okay. That's me like just uh, afraid I'm going to say something really fucking bonkers. Which I would have. Yeah, but I would have loved it. Nah, I yeah. Love that shit. But I kind of know you. I don't know her. Yeah, you know me you from a, what you see. Oh, I get a good sense. Like, you got a good sense of me. Like, I saw you at the airport a few weeks ago, and I pretty much summed you up in my brain in 30 seconds. And I text Nick and I said, just finally met Boris in person. He's so handsome. Why did you never tell me? And he's fucking weird. He's one of us. <laughs> That's what I text Nick. And he's like, what did yeah, he say? you're right. That's it. He goes, he is. He's great. Yeah, fuck him, you should have said more than that. Like, what are these no, I mean, I don't know. No, he, I mean, he talks about you. No, you I'm mean, just joking. You get mentioned all the time. Boris is Boris that. Um, but I didn't really get it. I'm like, oh, he's the finance guy. He's the apprentice guy, like whatever. I don't really understand Boris. Yeah, yeah. Then I met you in person and I was like, oh, I fucking get it. Like this guy is like you're weird and clever. Let's turn this around. Let's. Make, this is your podcast. But you are. You're Even weird you and you're clever and you're perceptive <laughs> and you care about things and you take in shit that people don't even realise you're taking in. Like it would be easy to write you off as, you know, just. Up another, yourself. Not up yourself, but just another I'm like. a little bit. Straight white, so you should be. Have you seen yourself? Straight white, dude, you got to lean into this more. I want to see a topless, like, men's health cover from you. <laughs> like, don't understand why this hasn't happened. Well, talk to Nick, if they pay me enough, I'll fucking do it. I'll like, fucking get you the deal. Years ago, oh I, tell you, I tell you a funny story about that. Years ago, I was I was down in North Bonner Surf Club and I used to be a member there and uh, I'd just been in the gym and um, doing a workout and uh, it was fucking middle of the summer. It was boiling hot. And I walked outside and uh, and I just had my shorts on, like, and I didn't put my shorts on. And I was so like, pumped, you know, because I just yes, had a you were jacked. Sesh. Yes. Yeah. And uh, anyway, the next day, Ginjal rings me up. He was running Channel 9 at the time. He rings, he says, oh, mate, fuck. He said, uh, I was doing The Apprentice, and he said, uh, oh, fuck. He said, I just had to buy a photograph of you. I said, what? <laughs> what fuck? A shirtless, uh, topless, whatever you call it, photograph. I said, who from? He said, uh, it was on one of those websites. You, who, and someone was two kilometres away, took a photograph of me. And uh, he put it into new ideas. So it's the only time, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about here. Why Can I find a topless shot? So I want to get you to do a topless shot. I don't know shot. why I'm saying You're uh, telling well, me a story. Think this, but I did, it did happen once. Yeah, you, got, you had a topless and shot. I, and he paid 20 grand for it. I thought, wow, where's my fucking share? Oh, my God. Because if someone took a photograph of me, I was saying, like, I should get some of that. It's my fucking photograph. Agreed. I got nothing. Dude, you're jacked though. Like how old are you right now in this moment? Six, six. You're 66? Mm. You're nearly 70? Three years off 70, yeah. You're fucking jacked. Like what are you doing and you Just should sell today it? Today I didn't do it. No, but try. why are you? You do not look your age. Yeah, but my dad's 90 nearly and he's he looks awesome. My yeah, old man's same. got my a, dad's a handshake 70 and, fucking strong as anything. My dad's 70 and looks 50. Fuck off. I could be old enough to be your dad. Yeah, my, oh my, my you're my mum's age. Oh, my God. Mm. That's okay. You look great. Thanks. Is that is this, is this, this where we'll go? <laughs> I was feeling shit this morning. This morning, actually, actually went out to dinner last night with a couple of mates, and um, you know when you go to those restaurants and uh, I assess restaurants based on how much salt they put in the food. Oh my god, same. And I wake in the middle of the night, fucking dry mouth. That's fucking it. <laughs> Never going back. Put the pencil straight through them, and I just had a shit sleep. And I woke up in the morning feeling like fucking rubbish, and uh, and I knew I had, to, I had to do something before here today, blah blah. blah. And uh, so I didn't train, so I slept in a little bit late later tonight. I was just laid in the bed listening to the fucking radio. So the BBC Science yeah, Show. I, I love it. And thank God you did, because you got that insight. If you had to train, you would have missed it. Uh, totally. I mean, I, I try to get something out of every minute of my life. Uh, so oh, that's and, exhausting. Yeah, but it is, well, I was going to ask you about exhaustion. Yeah. So I am all the time right yeah, now. So yeah. So do you get to a point? Yep. Ten o'clock tonight or whatever it is. Mm. Where you just go, no, no, I'm fucked. I feel that way all the time. I feel simultaneously overwhelmed and underwhelmed in my nervous system, twenty four hours a day. So like, I'm just so tired, but I just can't stop. But I'm just so tired. Like it's, I, I'm exhausted, and which I now know is um, like because I think I, I'm autistic and I'm about to get diagnosed. Um, I've taken in lights, sounds, smells, people. So that oh, that's exhausting me and then I've run around all day so my body's exhausted. So exhaustion's been a big problem for me my whole life uh, and especially and when I finally hit the wall and fell over and broke was when we went into lockdowns in Melbourne um, and I was I couldn't get out of bed. What was that like? What, so what, what, just describe it though. I mean in, like, phys like physically I'm talking about. It's just because I'm ADHD I don't have any executive function, right? So I'm not good Which at. Which means what? I'm not good at easy stuff. 
I'm not good at remembering to pay my electricity bill. I'm not good at making appointments. I'm not, I'm not good at filling out forms. Like your executive function in your brain, like that department is normally like, it's, it's really good at, it's the stuff of life, right? It's being a functioning adult. That department is there and it's in charge of making sure that every day you do the shit you have to do and in the right order. But for me, my executive function is so bad that if I get asked a question or to do a task, I go at it with 10, 10 things at once rather than one, do this first, Step one. move to second. There's no sequence in my brain. And also like I'll go to get a cup from the cupboard at my house and I'll notice the cupboard's dirty and I'm like, okay, I'm going to pull out all the cups. So I'll pull out all the cups so there's cups everywhere. I'll open the cupboard to get the stuff to clean it. I'll notice the cleaning club is messy so I'll pull out all that shit too. And then I'll go to the fridge because I need some food and like I'll fuck the fridge so I'll pull out all the food. So I'll be standing in the middle of the kitchen. I've gone to just get one cup but now every cupboard is empty <laughs> and it's a fucking bomb, right? That's my executive function disorder. And so, yeah, for, for me, just functioning is exhausting. Um, but I... I'm fucking exhausted. Yeah. Listen to you. It, it is. Try being in my head. I know. I've been trying to do that <laughs> for the last hour. Like, But, but I'm medicated now. I'm yeah. on stimulants. So what do they give you? They I'm on something called Concerta. So initially they start with like dexamphetamine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not good for I me. i got a son who's on Dexies. Yeah, and I, Dexies and I, not good I, for I me. I wish he'd fucking get off it, like... Because it made me anxious. Um, he couldn't sleep. Couldn't sleep and it would wear off really quickly. So I'm now on a, a thing called Concerta Slow Release. Sounds like a, a, a It's beautiful. It's a, a nice it sounds name. like an opera. Yeah, that's why I liked it. Um, Concerta And my slow daughter's release. on one called Vivance. Oh, that it sounds sound, like a feminine hygiene product. No, that sounds like an adult movie or something. <laughs> Vivance. I can just imagine what she looks like. Yeah, Vivance. But this is slow release um, and it works much better for me. But is, is it is a stimulant? Though, it's a stimulant. It? Yeah. And for me, I like I tried cocaine once and I felt like it knocked me out. And we never it made was, you sleep. It was always a joke yeah. amongst my friends. Like I just have never done cocaine because it's an expensive sedative. And I didn't realize that's because of my brain. Makeup, right? It so, floods your, but your brain with serotonin. Yeah. yeah. So um, the stimulants for me calm me down. Yeah. It's like putting glasses on my brain, um, and I can just get stuff done. But I can feel it wearing off sometimes, and like it's like in, in the distance, I can see like my normal brain's about to approach. So I've got to quickly get things done. So how how often do you have to take a stimulant a day? I take like, it every day. Yeah, yeah. In every the morning, day. Yeah. and I get it's a slow release. So you get a bit of a bump in the morning, and you get a bump in the afternoon. I've never been quite able to understand how a stimulant fixes somebody who's already stimulated. Yeah, so it, it acts as a counter stimulation. So it actually like it enables your the fastness to slow. Um, so it almost acts as, yeah, like a sedative for our brains. So yeah. some people take it who are neurotypical to it's like street speed. It's like yeah, you know, yeah, suburban totally. speed. All, all the brokers. Yeah, you right. Know, sitting there in the trading room, yeah. bang. Yeah, it keeps you awake. People use it to study. It, it's like it's a it is a regular. It's a class A drug. It's regulated. Yeah, like, it's yeah, hard yeah. to get it. Yeah, yeah. And when you go and get it at the pharmacy, they make you feel like a drug addict. Don't worry. You have got to get it. Um, Psych through a psychiatrist. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but for for our brains, it just stabilizes the dopamine. We're not constantly searching, searching, searching. So we're able to. We've got what we need chemical wise. So we're able to focus a bit better. Um, and that was life changing. And it works in half an hour. So the first time I took the medication, within half an hour, I was like, oh, okay. So normally there's like 10 voices in my head yelling at me and there was only like one and she was calm and she was telling me what was next and like I've never gone back. That's And that was nearly two years ago. It's funny, like in my business life, I've always been attracted to fast talkers. Mm. Um, I don't know what it is. There's, there's something about fast talkers that is appealing to me. Um, in a personal life, I don't really like it that much because it's well, fuck. I'm know. not like this personally, you know. No. But in, in a business sense, I am. There's fast talkers like James Packer, mm. who was my business partner for many years. He, he's a very fast talker, like ridiculously fast. Fast. Probably does have ADHD. Oh, um, he'll love this. But he's pathologizing. Never, <laughs> but he's never been um, diagnosed. Well, maybe has been diagnosed, yeah. but never told me about it. But, but. But at the same time, also very much a risk taker, like right. not scared of risk. Yeah. Um, but equally, in a lot of ways, quite sensitive. Same. Um, very sensitive to stuff and can go up and down. Yeah. Um, and and I there are other people who I could you know I could roll off a whole lot of them who are who are fast talkers. You're a fast talker. I mean, the speed at which you talk. Mm. 
to me, how you actually feel like you're slowing your, you could, as you demonstrated earlier, you could talk a lot faster. Mm -hmm. You'd be good at the end of those ads, you know, when you put the conditions on, mm -hmm. conditions and mm -hmm. some reply. They wouldn't have to speed me up. <laughs> Bang. Um, but, but these people in business, and I said it before, apart from being prolific, uh, think about concepts or create concepts, articulate them really beautifully. Mm -hmm. They repeat the articulation over and over and over. Everyone they meet, they're so uh, focused on that particular thing that they want to execute on. They're very bad at execution but they're so focused on it. That's the executive function, bad at execution. They repeat it to everybody. Yeah, right. And then by the end of, say, two or three weeks, they've actually perfected the articulation really? so fucking well Fine. that they can sell the concept to anybody. Fuck. So James would be on something, like he'd be on a, an idea and uh, he would practice it so many times with so many people. The only thing he would ever talk about would be this particular idea, whatever it might be. In, in our case it was the wizard business we did together. Mm. But he would practice it on everybody and every time I saw him he'd practice it on me and at the end of a couple of weeks he had articulated the essence of what we were doing. He created this articulation which was so fucking perfect. Mm. Um but it was just by practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing on everybody. Eliminate that word, bring in that word in the, this particular language word, uh, shorten, the, shorten the paragraphs down until he got it into an absolute perfect pitch mm. of about 30, 40 seconds. Wow. I'm amazed you, he could stick with I'd get bored. No, he would only take – after two weeks he would be bored. Yeah, right. That's it. So he was hyper-focusing on it. He just do that. in it. Yeah, right. It was like, um, I don't know, watching um, – Beautiful Mind or something like that, mm. like one of those sorts of mm. – it was like that. It was crazy. Mm. It was like that for me. And a lot of people bag him but I tell you, the guy is, for me, one of the most unique people the way he thought that I've ever experienced in my life. I could call him brilliant but, you know, it's – just doesn't come it across doesn't to people work. that I mean I don't know him and to me I don't know any of these things about him. You're giving a whole different – Brilliant is not – yeah, it's a weird thing, brilliance. Brilliance. It can be. It a, depends it, what context you're thinking. Twenty anyway. different types of brilliance. Yeah. I wouldn't call it, but, but it was just a fucking fascination with the way he, the way he thought relative to everyone else I knew, who, yeah. the way they thought, or the way I observe other people thinking. Mm. But uh, ultimately, it gave brilliant outcomes. And um, yeah, clearly, yeah, brilliant outcomes. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, like, um, but I don't know what it would be like to have to live with that um, and not and be in his position. Like, yeah, it's hard. I'd like a break from my brain every now and then. Yeah, I'd correct. like to be able to take it out. And he, one way of breaking with your brain is drugs. Yeah, drugs. Yeah, drugs have never been good for me. I'm not against them, and I'm really keen to look into psychedelics to treat some stuff. You know, some totally P T P T S D I have. Like, I'm really into. Looking into that, I'd love to be part of a study, um, you know, around psychedelics. I think they could really be interesting for my brain, especially, and they've been shown to work on people. Do you follow like Lex Freeman and uh, Joe Rogan, all those dudes? I, yeah, I mean, I know about Hoofman and whatever them, but I mean, they're not really in my, especially not Joe Rogan, but um, they're not really in my wheelhouse. But I'm definitely, but, but their conversations, yeah, they do for have sure. Stuff. I'm really open to it because I don't want to be reliant on uh, dr drugs for the rest of my life yeah. on medication, and if there's another way to deal with the other things my brain has to go through. I mean, I've mellowed and I'm 43 um, and I'm also introverted and pretty quiet when I'm on my own and with my really inner circle, I'm pretty, like, chill. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not always what goes up must come down, right? Yeah, so, yeah totally. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, and that's sort of what I'm interested in, like, do, do you collapse at a certain time? Like, oh yeah. yeah, my social battery is not very good, and I need a couple of days after I go to a function yeah, to recover. Totally, yeah, wears out. Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean, oh, I get exhausted. These, I'm spending three days in Sydney, and I'm gonna have to like not do anything. Yeah, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday to recover. That's that's cool. Uh, I spend a lot of time at home. A lot. Like Nick says, is worried. He says I'm a hermit. Um, my manager, your business partner. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. But, I, but a hermit because what really you're doing is recovering. I'm recovering. Yeah. Yeah. Because when I go out I have to be a certain way. and do, like I, Normally when I'm leaving the house it's to work and it's to do a show or a TV perform. appearance, perform, um, which takes a lot out of me. Yeah, yeah. And also just I'm not very good at reading people's faces and, and I, I'm also just hyper alert and vigilant to not fucking up. Um, you like to do a good job. Yeah. Always. But when you're on the stage, say if you're on a stage. It's my heaven. It's like it's the closest I get to getting a break be, from my brain. Just before you get on the stage. Yeah. 
What's going on? Quiet time. Dark. No one's allowed to talk to me. Yeah. Um, I need to be able to like explode out. Like no one's allowed to come near me. I can't, I have to just, like I don't want any pump ups or nothing. Like I just need an hour of. Leave me fucking alone. Yeah, and everyone knows. In the green room. So then you get up on the stage. And, and, I, and, it's, and, it's and what happens to the dopamine? Through the roof. Yeah. In the moment. I'm out of my brain. I'm in my body. Yeah. Like the only way to get out of your head is to get in your body, yeah. right? Yeah. Exercise, et cetera. And it's. The only, the closest I get, it's religion. It's my spiritual time. It's my religion. It's like how people feel when they go to church and they're at one with something and they're channeling something. When I'm on stage singing, telling jokes, it's like what I was born to do. And then when you get off? I'm fucked. Yeah. I cry. I don't, I've never been one to go out and celebrate after a tour ends. Um, that's not, I, I have to go to sleep. Like I have to just go home and wrap my, literally wrap myself in a weighted blanket and usually cry. Um, and everything, my tours always go well. Um, and that's my. Because you give it hundred percent. I've given more than I have. Yeah. Gone outside of my skin. But you sort of have to because. Always. And my show's tough. They're tough topics. I've done, I've done a stand-up show about miscarriage. I've done a stand-up show about divorce. I've done a stand-up show about, you know, lose, leaving today FM breakfast. Um, all my stand-up shows are about hard topics that I've had to go through and process and um, figure out and then make jokes about them. Yeah, you attach comedy to it. Yeah. 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 So it's uh, – I had Nick Giannopoulos in here a couple of weeks ago and I, I reckon Nick's got the same thing as you've got. And, oh, Gio, uh, for sure. Yeah, I know Gio. Yeah. For, for sure. Yeah, and, uh, 100%. Like, and he went into some really deep conversation with us about, you know, Wog Boys Forever and why, you know, why he started the whole Wog, Wog thing, you know, the whole Wog, Wog Boys movement. And uh, I'm so glad he did. It was so cool. It, it, it killed – by the way, it went off. It killed – he killed it. And uh, – but he's a deep, deep dude. Yeah. Very deep. And he's got a lot of similarities to mm. you. You and he have a lot of similarities. Yeah. He can bounce from comedy to series. Yeah. But but fucking do it really well. Like mm. uh and I'm so glad you told me that uh about how you feel. I, I before you do a show, like most people think that show people, what is termed a show person mm. like you, um, that uh that you're like um you're like Rhonda Birchmore. Mm-hmm. You know, you're a singing, all singing, dancing, mm. you know, entertainer and like Rhonda's like that all the time. She's always on. Okay? Mm. Um, you, whereas. I'm not. You're not. Mm-mm. And I, so I actually really appreciate your honesty today. I, I think that's fantastic. Um, Thanks. You've given me a further insight into the um, condition that that you're being blessed with. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I know the condition quite well. Um, and. Uh, I, I just, I guess I want to say, what do I want to say to him? I want to say. I feel like you're going to make me cry. <laughs> thanks for thanks for bringing in that energy that I could feel outside there on my <laughs> right hand shoulder. I'm glad you felt it. But thanks for bringing it in. Oh, always, of course. Yeah, but uh, because it's pretty cool. Look, my, my whole life I've just wanted to be seen and you saw me even though I hadn't said anything. So thank you for seeing me. <laughs> Why am I crying? You're the worst. This is a business podcast, isn't it? Why no, am I no, crying? no, no. Just go straight talk. <laughs> Don't you remember I checked in the beginning before we did the show which fucking podcast I'm on? Am I on straight talk or mental? But this is straight Mate, talk. You've made this little ADHD girl feel very seen, and that is. Well, you deserve to be. Thank you. Oh my god, you're I excellent. did not think no, I really are. You're excellent. You're Mark excellent. Boris's podcast. Thank it was you. so good. Thanks very much. Thanks Emma. for having me. I feel like giving you a hug. <laughs> oh my god! Why did you make me cry? Thank you. You're welcome. That was, that was great. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, my God. <laughs>